going to require a good faith effort on an international level to come to terms with. But isn't the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency participating in the cover-up? Uh, I kind of looked at them during the accident as the equivalent of the nuclear version of Fox News in oh, the country. Oh, Bob. Uh, in oh terms of, you know, because they kept they kept issuing all these press statements as the, these reactors were blowing up saying everything's fine. So they have it under control now, and then, then there would be another explosion. Uh, and then you would see the footage of the explosion. I think one of the most dramatic uh, things that sort of turned, you know, made it no longer much of an abstraction for me was to see the satellite photos after the explosion in Unit 3 and to see the spent fuel pool exposed to the open sky and billowing out steam and knowing that uh, that pool was damaged and was was full of, uh, you know, enormous amounts of radioactivity was probably escaping. Plus plutonium. Plus the plutonium. Plus the plutonium. I mean, I, I am concerned about plutonium, but I am much more concerned about the cesium because there's so much more of it, and it volatilizes more easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and really is, the, I think, the, the, the reference contaminant that, that is, defines uh, habitability, quite frankly, whether well, you, what do you what, to what, what is live there or not. Um, I'm interviewing Bob Alvarez, who was a senior policy advisor to the secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment, and he is a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies. Bob Alvarez, describe what is actually happening now at Fukushima, right now as we speak. Well, as best I can piece together, I mean, a lot of the information is still fragmentary and only being provided on a limited basis by the government and the, uh, and the owner of the reactors. But what I... I've been able to ascertain is that they, they, they are not out of the woods. Uh, they are not have yet to uh, achieve the goal of establishing what you call a closed loop cooling system to make sure that the the contents of the reactors and the spent fuel pools, which are still very radioactive and potentially very dangerous if uh, they lose their water supplies, uh, are. Uh, are, are being supplied with a, a regular supply of water, but also water from a system that's not leaking like a sieve. And it is uh, leaking like not, a sieve. And, and got, it is. And there are three masses of molten uranium called corium that have hit their containment vessels in units one, two, and three. And they say, I mean, how are they going to how are they going to get rid of that? How are they going to remove it? Well, all I can say is that in in the United States when we had the Three Mile Island accident, which was uh, nowhere near as severe as that which has taken place in Fukushima, yeah. is that it took 20 years to remove the contents years. of the core. Yeah, only one-third of it melted, so 20 years. <laughs> it took um, 20 years to remove the contents of the reactor core. The, and there are estimates now that the Fukushima situation is two to five times worse than Chernobyl, and we know from the New York Academy of Sciences report that maybe a million people have already died in the first 25 years after Chernobyl. So you can multiply a million by, you know, two to five, huh? Could you? Would, would that you could. Be? You could. I mean, in terms of cleaning up the mess at uh, Fukushima uh, and compared to Chernobyl, I mean, there's, there's no dispute uh, that the mess at Chernobyl is, so radioactive right now that it will take at least another 100 years before they could get around to do, to doing anything with that mess. At Chernobyl. Uh, yeah. When you think about 100 year time frames, uh, you know, um, what was Australia like 100 years ago? Um, pretty primitive. What will it be like 100 years from now? Uh, you know, these these are these are not insignificant time frames. So. Uh, I, I'm of the opinion right now that the the spent fuel and especially the molten fuel from the reactors at, at Fukushima are going to be there for a very long time with no no, no place to go. 
Well, uh, I'm also, and, yeah, go on. So, and I think the major concern is it's got to be to to do everything possible to keep any further radioactivity from escaping. Yeah, but you know, I am using this figure, and 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 apparently it's accurate that every day, twelve thousand trillion becquerels of radiation are escaping into the air every day. Have you heard that number? Uh, I've seen the numbers. I just don't remember 12, all these numbers. 12,000 billion the trillion becquerels. 12, and becqu yeah, 12,000 trillion becquerels. A becquerel is a disintegration per second. Right, right. So therefore, huge... And, and then I read a report today, um, I don't know, in the New York Times or something that says, oh, the radiation is where it's decreasing, the amount that's being emitted. I, the lies are just flabbergasting. I mean, if I lied in medicine, I'd be killing my patients. And that's what's happening. They're killing people by lying. And the awful thing is that the Japanese government knew pretty early, because they had monitors, where the plume of intense radioactive material was going, but they didn't tell the people so the people could flee because they didn't I mean, want to I create panic. There is this mindset, which I think is a, um, a cultural mindset that is, has its origins, quite frankly, in the U.S. nuclear weapons program. Yeah, the weapons that's program. Wa that's washed over, watch, washed over into the commercial nuclear industry, yeah. which is um, that it, the worst possible thing you can do is to scare the public and that their fear is worse than telling them the truth. That's unbelievable. And, unbelievable. and so it's that logic. And when you have a system of where people are operating and are encouraged to operate it uh, by their government in isolation and secrecy and privilege, where they only talk to themselves and uh, believe, uh, be begin to believe that the that the public is more of an enemy than an ally. Uh, you know, the, there's this attitude that that, he, that that quickly emerges, which is what they don't know can't hurt us. What they don't and, know can't hurt us. That's amazing. And this is a, an, a sort of a cultural ethos that was uh, uh, very well refined by our nuclear weapons program by the by the 1950s. Uh, this is why so many nuclear weapons were exploded in the open air in the continental United States and the Pacific and elsewhere. Uh, because uh, and and there, there the other the other sort of uh, logic that, that I've seen is this logic of what you call the greater good, uh, which is uh, well yes we have to sacrifice people but there's a greater good involved here, and in the case of nuclear weapons, for example, the greater good was to deter uh, the Soviet Union uh, and those kinds of things. So in the meantime, you know, we wound up uh, putting our own people in harm's way without their knowledge and consent, uh, our, and our government w was doing this with impunity. And this has all come out. I mean, I'm not revealing anything that... Uh, is uh, a new revelation. This is sort of what's come out in the last 20 or so years. But we're dealing with a culture. Uh, I, I call it, it's been called the cult of the atom. Uh, we're dealing with a culture, a mindset that has largely been cultivated by government uh, that encourages isolation, secrecy, uh, misleading of the public, uh, rationalizations that could never hold up to the scrutiny of, of a democratic society to carry out an agenda on the behalf of a bureaucracy and a technology which is uh, now proving to be catastrophic and ultra-harmful to the world. As you talk, uh, I think to myself that the work we did in the 80s as physicians for social responsibility, we translated the arcane nuclear language that you've just been describing uh, that has, was engendered by the nuclear physicists and the government into lay language to describe what nuclear weapons actually mean to people when they get exploded over cities and a nuclear war. That must have freaked them out of their heads, do you think? I think so. And, I mean, 
there's some humorous things, too. I mean, there is dark humor, but, you know, uh, I recall going to congressional hearings here in the United States and listening to witnesses from the uh, government nuclear program describing uh, events such as uh, rapid energetic disassemblies. Yep. What does that mean? Explosion. Rapid energetic disassemblies. Mm Mm-hmm. I know, and when people get killed in nuclear war, the people are disassembled, disassembled. Or, or uh, they use these uh, uh, terms, health effects. Health um, effects? Yeah, health effects. Like what? Uh, dying of cancer. Health effects. I mean, that's, you know, they, I mean, it's, it's the, the, all the, the, the terminology has been so, so, so neutralized and, and, made so uh, bland and that uh, people don't realize what this means. Uh, so we have a terrible history in this country, which we're still trying to come to terms with, uh, uh, where our government deliberately misled the public about the dangers of radioactive fallout from bomb testing. I wonder and how many people deliberately, deliberately misled the public. About you know, it. Uh, America exploded more than a thousand bombs above ground uh, in the desert, in Nevada, and elsewhere, and absolutely doused America with radioactive fallout. And the incidence of cancer continues to rise now. And when you think that the incubation time for cancer is any time from five to eighty years, almost certainly the increase in cancer partly is caused by that fallout. And the National Cancer Institute only estimated thyroid cancers, I think 115,000 from radioactive iodine fallout, but it's never estimated the number of cancers caused by the fallout from strontium-90, cesium-137, plutonium-239, americium, and all the rest of the fallout that occurred. Would you like to comment on that, Bob Alvarez? Well, I mean, in fairness, to the National Cancer Institute, they were asked by Congress to only look at iodine-131. Why? Uh, I, I cannot explain that, but let me sort of finish the story here. And they were asked in the early 1990s to do, or in the early 1980s to do this, mainly because of concern of fallout from uh, weapons testing in Nevada. And they were asked to look at hot spots of iodine-131 from weapons testing in Nevada in the continental United States. How much was released? Where did it go? Mm-hmm. How much got absorbed into the food chain? What kinds of exposures did people receive of different uh, ages and genders? And then what 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 what, uh, what happened to these people in terms of estimated cancers? Yep. Uh, what happened was that uh, the National Cancer Institute to suppress the study for five years. And I had found out about it while working in the Energy Department in 1997 uh, from a reporter who the, the, our, our news media was on to it and was trying to find out more about it. So I was in a, a position of some authority to, uh, to summon the National Cancer Institute experts to brief me about this study. Yeah. And they gave me a briefing, and it, and it was uh, essentially a, a series of color-coded maps of the United States that mm. sort of indicated uh, how much was released, where did it go, what the concentrations were in in uh, grass and vegetation and in milk, and how, what the doses were to various people uh, of different ages and genders. And uh, as I was flipping through this thing, I you know I kind of know knew what the numbers meant, and it was, uh, I, the first thing that caught my attention was that the the contamination of the milk was so large in certain regions, especially the upper Midwest, where a great deal of our, at that time, a great deal of our, our, uh, our milk supply was being produced, mm. uh, that had, had we had the, the, what we call protective action guides that we have in place today, to deal with nuclear accidents, which did not exist then, uh, the milk the milk production for entire regions of the country would have had to be removed from human consumption. 